Are you, uh, Brooke, are you able to hear me all right still? Just want to make sure. Yep, perfectly. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Well, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. So um, my name is uh, Daniel Aris. I'm uh, an infectious disease physician uh, and lead medical epidemiologist with the University Department of Health and Medical Hygiene uh, with the Congregate Setting Investigation and Response Unit. Um, we are the group of the health department that's tasked with investigating cases of COVID-19 um, in a variety of congregate uh, residential settings throughout New York City, um, and while well supporting those facilities with infection control guidance and best, best practices. So um, I want to welcome you to this webinar about preventing the spread of COVID-19 in adult homes um, and adult care facilities. Um, it's been a long time in the works, and so we're very happy to be able to present uh, this information today. Um, I think that's the but um, uh, the infection control concepts will, will actually be pretty broadly applicable across all the congregate residential settings. Um, so besides for presenters uh, from the New York City Department of Health, uh, we also have some representatives from, uh, from New York State, uh, like Heidi Hayes, who's uh, the acting director um, for the New York State Department of Health Division of Adult Care um, uh, uh, facilities and assisted living surveillance. Um, all right, so if you could start your, your running this, right? So if you just go to the next slide. So, um, so Dan, this question, just, yeah. just want to let you know, um, you're a little bit uh, cloudy. So if you just, just a little bit garbled. Um, all right. I'll, all let's, right. Let's try this. Out. Try a little slower. Um, let me know if, uh, if that helps at all. Uh, so, so this session um, is designed for staff at adult care facilities, uh, including adult homes, uh, enriched housing programs, assisted living programs, and assisted living residences. Um, it's designed to provide uh, updated guidance and best practices uh, um, for uh, adult care facilities and it's an opportunity for competency training on infection control. Uh, the slides and Q&A information will be after the webinar. Uh, next slide, please. So the goals here are um, sort of, I just stated, to provide an update, providing update on the state of COVID-19 in New York City. Um, we're going to provide uh, the most update updated guidance on preventing infection control, uh, infection spread while uh, caring for residents in the congregate setting. Uh, and our hope is to increase awareness of uh, New York City uh, health department activities um, uh, as we assist residential congregate settings in New York City. Um, and as a, just a, a, a point of house, uh, there, is, there should be a, te uh, a text, text box uh, on the right side your screen, um, and so you can use that uh, to ask any questions that you have. Uh, I'm going to be monitoring that during the presentation, um, and uh, then we'll, we'll be able to kind of uh, uh, curate those and, and ask them all at the end, okay? So with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to uh, Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dan, you can hear me okay? Yep, you're good. Perfect, excellent. Thank you. All right, so again, my name is Brooke Talbot. I've been working on this team with Daniel and Joanne, um, who are our presenters today, that have been um, reaching out to uh, adult care facilities and um, uh, providing guidance uh, to you and to make sure that you have all the resources that you need. Um, so first, I just wanted to give you an update uh, a little about where we are now in New York City as uh, it pertains to COVID-19. So the pandemic is still continuing worldwide and there are over 20,000 deaths that were attributed to COVID-19 among New York City residents. But by mid-April, the daily case counts and hospitalizations and deaths peaked 
and they have been declining since, which suggests that the mitigation efforts, the social distancing, um, these uh, efforts that we've put in place um, are working and that we still must maintain vigilance in these practices as the city is transitioning into the suppression of the virus and as we're continuing our activities um, with reopening the city and um, uh, reopening and allowing uh, visitations and, and more access into uh, your facilities. And for more daily updates, you actually can, uh, as uh, individuals, go to nyc.gov slash health and search for the COVID-19 data summary. And that will give you uh, a clear picture of um, the epidemiology that's going on on our data summaries. So what should you do uh, as staff members and as administrators of your uh, facilities? Um, most of you that have been experiencing these uh, COVID-19 cases in your facility um, have been going through infection control practices, but we just want to go over some uh, additional guidance or refresher guidance um, for those of you with some familiarity and make sure that everyone is up uh, to speed on um, uh, the uh, infection control practices that we uh, recommend. So um, the Centers of Disease for Disease Control and Prevention has actually recommended that at least one staff member man manage the infection control programs of their facility and the resources uh, for more advanced training in this area can be found um, at the end of this presentation and at, on CDC's website. However, every single medical and non-medical staff member should be trained and empowered to practice strategies that prevent the spread of COVID-19 in these congregate residential settings between the residents and between the staff members as well. So by now we have a good understanding that COVID-19 spreads through contact with, ex uh, with exhaled droplets from infected persons. So this puts those living and working in congregate residential settings at a higher risk for contracting and spreading illness. In these settings, close proximity when caring or working for residents, uh, when in contact with shared equipment or high touch surfaces like uh, counters that are, uh, or doorknobs, um, pieces of technology or pieces of shared equipment. Um, the interaction of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people uh, without any appropriate infection control. Um, and then also, uh, can all quickly spread virus. And additionally, those that are ill workers or residents when they're coming, going from these settings um, have the potential to introduce or reintroduce COVID-19 into the facility. So um, this is, really just to broadly demonstrate and as a brief reminder that you should be thinking about infection control at multiple levels because of all these ways that COVID-19 can um, uh, spread and, and uh, come into your facility. So this includes PPE, but it also includes thinking about how residents, guests, and employees interact with the facility as a whole and how these interactions can slow or speed up the spread of illness. Primarily, you can think of the inter, uh, infection control as practices that um, prevent disease entry through source control. So that's like covering um, uh, the mouth and nose with a face covering. Um, by improving living and working in uh, environment controls, like ensuring good airflow in the building, uh, regular and effective cleaning and distancing measures in that space, adhering to or uh, attributing to guidance that is put in place by your, you as administrators or by uh, other administrators and managers, um, as well as consistently using uh, and correctly using personal protective equipment or PPE. So what we're going to now do is just walk through some of these best practices. Um, that you can uh, implement and uh, rem give you some reminders or refreshers um, or present some information that might be uh, 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 new to you or gets you up to speed on uh, ways that you can control uh, COVID-19 spread. So we'll start with source control, which encompasses the physical measures that uh, prevent the introduction and spread of illness. And it starts with entry into your facility. 
So first and foremost, you are the first line of defense against the spread of COVID-19 into your facility. And as New York continues its phased reopening, it's important to continue to wear face coverings to and from work. We still recommend that facilities manage their front entrances to assure that only those that are authorized to enter or such as the residents or workers will be able to access the building. Um, so having a way to manage the front doors effectively uh, so that it prevents the unwanted or unexpected entry um, is really important. So for example, one possibility would be to lock doors uh, from the outside or require some kind of key call access to manage who enters and exits the building if it's possible. Um, and high visibility signs that are posted in the entrance that are very simple and clear and communicate the visitation policies are also important visual cues for those that are uh, either coming and going as residents or those that may uh, want entry into the building that might not be allowed uh, yet. Uh, so we also recommend that you have your hand sanitizers uh, readily available immediately upon entry. So somewhere near a sign-in desk um, as um, your employees are coming in or your residents are coming back into the facilities um, so that people have this ready access right from the get-go. So on July 10th, New York State did update its guidance on reinstating guest visitation in adult care facilities that meet um, certain benchmarks. And those benchmarks are including, but not limited to compliance with employee testing, the submission of safety and visitation plans, your facility is in compliance with all the reporting regulations um, and that there has not been a new uh, a resident newly testing positive for COVID-19 in the last 28 days. So the state has issued very specific guidelines for making sure that a facility is ready to accept and maintain visitations. Um, and you will find those very specific guidelines and future updates at the State Department of Health Information for Healthcare Providers page, which is listed here on the slide. And again, will be available to you um, when these, uh, uh, this recording is shared. Um, so I encourage you all to, as you're planning for your visitations, um, to be uh, very mindful of these particular guidelines. Um, and to just make sure that uh, you are you are looking at those uh, specifications that are in the guidance. But uh, in line with these guidelines, we wanted to emphasize the key factors for preventing the introduction of COVID-19 into or out of the facility while your staff interact with residents, guests, and other staff members while they're coordinating these visits. So visitors should be screened for symptoms and their visitations documented on the sign-in sheet. All visitors should be given easy to read fact sheets about preventing illness um, and their expectations of preventing illness uh, in the facility. Um, there should be enough staff on hand to make sure that these visitors and residents are safely distancing themselves and able to provide the resources for infection control, um, including masks and hand, hand sanitizers, uh, which all visitors must have um, upon entering the building. We are recommending that visit, the visitation space be outside, um, but indoor spaces can be used if appropriate social distancing, six feet can be maintained. And these visitation spaces should be appropriately cleaned after guests and residents are done using the space. Um, and additionally, uh, or finally, patients who have re recently tested positive for COVID-19 or are in a 14-day quarantine period should not be receiving visitors um, during this time to, uh, in order to prevent the spread of uh, illness uh, outside of the facility. So let's focus on what you as staff members uh, can expect um, wh while you're working at uh, uh, your facility on the day to day. So by now facilities should be screening all their employees at the start of a shift uh, for symptoms of COVID. And you as a healthcare or non-healthcare staff uh, should have your temperature taken with a non-contact or disposable thermometer. Um, if a non-contact thermometer is used, see if it's possible to di disinfect between uses. 
Um, and an easy way to ensure that all staff uh, that are new and returning um, is to post very clear and simple notices about where they can go to get screened at the, uh, either at the entrance or if there's um, a specific uh, screening space toward the entrance of the facility that you've designated. Um, or if there are spaces where you've decided to uh, have your residents or your um, staff members be tested um, and to have some kind of clear sign in area to track the staff at these uh, screenings. Um, we've also seen some examples of um, facilities that have created pick up and drop off areas for clean and for used PPE. So that's the image that you see on the right hand side, um, just as a way that you can keep your uh, uh, supplies organized to make sure that um, no one is leaving with any kind of contaminated material um, and that you can drop off and, and uh, either sanitize or dispose of uh, PPE as, as needed. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and just re uh, talk about the current testing requirements for staff. So yes, there, uh, there's still a requirement to get tested for COVID-19 in order to work. Uh, so staff should be aware of whether they are up to date on their testing requirements. So since New York City started phase two reopening, all staff should be tested at least one time a week with a diagnostic test. And staff can opt out of testing, but um, you will not be allowed to work in an adult care facility until you meet that testing requirement. And at this time, all uh, staff who have a positive diagnostic test or reactive serological test for uh, SARS-CoV-2 are still required to be tested to meet this requirement. Um, but there's, you know, con uh, this requirement may be reconsidered at later times um, as we learn more and more about um, immunity and uh, continue our phase to be opening. But I should continue to emphasize, and you should continue to emphasize that if you do feel ill, you should stay home from work. So this is just to go over the difference between those tested, those tests that are out there, um, the differences between what is available as a diagnostic test versus uh, the antibody test, which is um, uh, not used uh, to designate whether or not you have a COVID-19 infection. So the diagnostic tests um, are the PCR tests um, or uh, that um, come with a nose swab. So those are the ones where you're getting your nose swabbed. Um, and a positive test means that a person likely has COVID-19 right now. So if you are receiving these results from um, either a laboratory or someone is bringing results to you as an administrator, these test descriptions tend to look something like uh, 2019 NCOV RNA, um, SARS-CoV-2 PCR, or some type of NAA positive probe uh, description. And in contrast, an antibody test is a, is a blood test, and a positive test means that sometime a person's immune system responded to COVID-19 infection. And so those test results, if they are uh, presented to you, tend to say something like uh, antibody or they have uh, the abbreviation IgG or IgM in them. So staff do not have to be tested at the facility to meet the facility testing requirements, but you should follow your facility's testing plan accordingly. And if you or your facility are struggling to get that testing or to maintain the testing for your, um, for your facility, there are over 100 available testing sites which can accommodate those needs. And so this, uh, the link at nyc.gov slash COVID test should help you locate sites that are close to you for testing uh, to help you meet those needs. So signage in a facility is um, a great way to help communicate the infection control best practices uh, when it's simple and clear in, in a highly visible area. So we're gonna go over some of that in terms of uh, infection control. So when you're displaying signs, especially when it's related to your resident care, um, you should be putting them in uh, clear and, and easy to see spaces, as well as in, uh, it's recommended we can, you can put them in a plastic pouch um, to display 
uh, different signs. So you can wipe them down if needed. And we, uh, we recommend signs that demonstrate healthy hand hygiene very clearly and that demonstrate uh, the personal protective equipment that's needed for certain spaces, especially rooms where residents require medical care. And ideally, these signs will be posted directly outside of a door in a visible place for care staff so that it's very specific to the need of that specific uh, resident or the area where you have um, either uh, uh, placed ill residents or um, uh, uh, healthy residents as well. And just for general prevention, you can have signs that are visible for all employees um, to reinforce and, and for residents to reinforce hand hygiene, source control, and remind employees to remain home if ill. So you can find these are just some examples that we have of signs that are available to you. Um, if you go to the New York City's 311 web portal and search for a flu poster, you can request these signs um, that talk about covering your cough, washing your hands, and some specific recommendations about staying home for if you uh, feel ill or think you have uh, coronavirus. So we're going to make sure that we review some PPE basics, including what constitutes PPE, how to appropriately remove and put on PPE, as well as some ideas for continuing to preserve PPE. So PPE the, or personal protective equipment is the equipment that protects against the virus spread when you need to make direct contact uh, with um, ill or uh, ill residents um, or you are the residents that are receiving any kind of direct care. So these pieces of equipment include disposable gloves, gowns, face shields, eye masks, face masks, and respirator. Uh, respirators. The kind of PPE needed, dif uh, needed differs uh, depending on whether you are caring for someone with COVID-19 or suspected symptoms, or if you are providing care for someone without symptoms. So for symptomatic or ill patients, disposable gloves, a respirator or a mask uh, and goggles and a gown are recommended. If you are providing care to someone without symptoms, gloves and a surgical mask should always be worn. And if care involves any splashes or aerosolized materials, then a gown or goggles should also be worn. And so you, the symptoms that you should be looking out for with uh, these patients include fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headaches, uh, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting or diarrhea. And again, with some older adults, they may present uh, a little bit differently than some of these symptoms as well. Um, so if there's a you know, change in set with um, confusion or if there's lower responsiveness or a change in any kind of normal behavior or general shift in wellness, that sh you should be aware of that um, as, a, as possible symptoms. So masks and respirators also differ in the look and protection and masks have a loose and fitted protection, uh, uh, loose fit and protect against most sprays and splashes. There's no require for any kind of fit testing, and they should be worn over the nose and mouth for best use. A, resp a respirator, in contrast, has a very tight seal and has a greater protection against small and large aerosolized droplets um, than a mask when, worn, when it's worn appropriately. So these should only be worn by the staff who have gotten fit tested and have had the seal checked before each use in order for them to be uh, most effective. So PPE should be somewhere central for all employees as they work and, and uh, in residence rooms. So uh, additional PPE like gloves should be placed outside of a residence room so that there's easy um, access to, to uh, clean PPE and materials. And there should be a sufficient supply of PPE that could be available for uh, every patient interaction. So since some PPE, particularly masks and respirators, can be used for an extended period uh, while we are still working to conserve PPE, um, this is just a few examples of ways that you can preserve your PPE. 
So by folding a mask uh, so that when you have a surgical mask so that the outside or the contaminated area that's been facing uh, the outside world um, is on the inside, that can help with um, uh, preventing self-contamination when you're removing a mask. And you can also store these masks in reusable bowls or paper bags as long as the storage material itself um, is individualized and it allows for airflow that doesn't lock in any kind of uh, moisture. So um, we also want to emphasize that just uh, stacking, stacking any kind of respirators, um, uh, just not to stack them inside of each other um, as well. So I mentioned that uh, some PPE can be reused um, and can be conserved. So this is just a way to think through whether or not you're making a choice about certain PPE being used. Uh, gloves should be changed after every patient interaction. Um, and it's imperative to change any materials that do get wet or soiled um, and to not reuse those. Gowns can be used um, for an extended period of time, so that means they can be worn um, with more than one resident at a time. Um, but they should only be worn, it should only be one gown per health care provider before washing or disposing, so not, not sharing between, um, uh, between um, care staff. And res respirators or masks can be worn while also caring for multiple patients. Um, but the best way to move is to actually go from no known illness um, with, so the, the least risk for spreading disease to uh, the most risk to avoid any contamination. So that's some groups with no known illness to residents that may be ill, but there's no COVID-19 diagnosis to a COVID-19 positive resident. So, um, now we can talk a little bit more just specifically about putting on PPE or donning PPE effectively in order to prevent contamination um, of the equipment that you use uh, to ensure that it best protects you from infection and uh, protects others as well. So a big part of this just starts with hand hygiene. So either washing your hands with soap or water or using hand sanitizer and never go wrong with uh, hand hygiene uh, during any point in time as you're, as you're um, donning and eventually taking off or doffing PPE. Um, so these are the steps that you can use for donning your PPE. The order is important so that you can keep all the materials germ free from the start. So first perform your hand hygiene, followed by your mask or respirator, uh, then goggles. Next, if a gown is needed, you put on your gown, which ideally will tie in the back. Um, and then finally, you'll put on gloves, uh, which you will make sure will cover the wrist of your gown so that you have full coverage of your entire arm. Let's focus specifically in on masks, since you as a staff member should be wearing this during your resident interaction. So the best way to do this, if you have a mask, is to grasp it by the loose uh, the loops or the ties with clean hands and secure behind both ears or tie behind the base of the neck and the top of the head. Um, you should make sure that the mask fit shape to your nose by just gently pinching it and ensuring that the mask covers the mouth, nose, and chin. And lastly, try to avoid touching the outside of the front of the mask while you're wearing it so that you can avoid uh, contaminating your hands or contaminating the outside of the mask. So now when you're removing and you're, you've had your interaction with your residents, um, you're ready to take off your material, um, it's pretty close to the reverse of donning and you should consider every outside surface contaminated while you're doffing. So let's focus specifically in on glove removal. Um, the safest way to remove gloves is to start by pinching the wrist of one glove with the other gloved hand and peeling away to turn the glove inside out and hold onto that removed glove in the covered hand. So with your clean bare hand, you can now slip a finger into the wrist of the gloved hand and do the same, but you're peeling the glove inside out until both gloves are bunched together and then dispose of this in a covered trash can and then immediately wash or sanitize your hands. You should uh, remove your gloves before exiting a patient room and tossing it into a garbage can inside of the room. Um, by the door. 
So uh, then you can proceed with the removal of your other PPE, starting with your gown if you are wearing it, uh, before you exit a, a residence room. So you would do this by untying it from the back and rolling or folding so that the outside always faces inward, uh, again, to avoid self-contamination and um, to keep as much of the outside contaminated part um, uh, not open to the air. So you can dispose of this gown in a covered trash or a laundry bin if it's reusable um, inside of the room, and then immediately perform hand hygiene and exit the room. Then you can uh, remove eyewear and then the mask by the loops or the strings and perform hand hygiene each time. There are several video demonstrations that shows these techniques and I really encourage you to watch as much as needed uh, for your own understanding. So we've provided some of the links um, and resources that CDC had put together. Um, and further, you may find it useful to practice these donning and doffing uh, techniques with another staff member as a way to make sure you understand steps completely and can effectively protect yourself and other residents. Um, so having some kind of buddy to just spot check you to make sure um, you know, you're, you're not accidentally touching that, uh, some bare skin with a glove or something like that uh, can be really uh, effective and helpful. So any PPE that is getting discarded or laundered should be put in some kind of covered isolation cart. So these are just some pictured examples of something you could be looking for if you don't already have uh, something like this in your facility. Um, and wheeled carts can help if there's limited space. Um, um, but however, during disposal, there should be no need to touch an actual container if you're uh, throwing away gloves or, or um, gowns or any kind of material. So for example, a wide brim and a sturdy opening is more effective in preventing um, staff from contaminating that um, uh, disposal bin or being contaminated by the disposal bin than a trash bag that's tied to a banister or something like that. Something uh, with, that can either remain open just um, so that you can just easily toss uh, in discarded materials. All right, so and with that, I'm going to uh, pass the presentation over to Joanne, who's going to go over some uh, last um, uh, uh, other best practices that we have. Thank you, Brooke. Um, good afternoon. My name is Joanne Casarella, and I work on the long term care facility outreach team at the New York City Department of Health, and I also help to coordinate point prevalence survey testing at adult care facilities. So next we'll talk about some strategies around cleaning your facilities. Oh, perfect. So how should you clean your facility? You should make sure EPA registered hospital grade disinfectants are available for frequent cleaning of high touch surfaces and shared resident care equipment. A list of these disinfectants can be found on the link above on the slide at epa.gov. Another important strategy to ensure the effective use of the cleaning product is to follow the instructions on the label, which includes the appropriate contact time you need to keep the cleaner on a surface in order for it to be effective. The contact time is often listed in small font and can be hard to read, so we suggest adding labels to cleaners with the appropriate contact time in large bold writing so staff can clearly see it. You can also make sure staff watches or clocks are available for those staff conducting environmental services so they can track contact time. Let me just, oh, perfect. It's important to inform staff conducting environmental services of the correct process for proper cleaning of equipment and room surfaces. These strategies include moving from top to bottom in order to prevent recontamination, moving from clean to dirty areas, moving from low touch to high touch areas, and in this regard, think about increasing the frequency of cleaning high touch surfaces such as doorknobs and handles and wipe down shared equipment such as desks, phones, keyboards at least once during every shift, if not more. And lastly, move from areas with no illness to those with known illness to prevent any contamination. Next, we'll move on to some social distancing and quarantine strategies. So facilities should take reasonably available steps to adhere to social distance guidelines. How social distancing is implemented may vary on a facility to by facility level. Some strategies, strategies we recommend include encouraging residents with COVID to stay in their rooms, 
separate or removing furniture that may encourage congregating in common areas. You'll see in the picture above tape was used to discourage multiple people from sitting on this bench. Tape can also be used to create visual cues on floors or in the elevators. You can also create physical barriers in outside spaces to discourage residents from leaving the facility. And lastly, set processes to allow for remote communication, such as allowing residents to connect with loved ones via video call or cell phone while making eye contact through a closed window. Next, we'll review some strategies around cohorting and quarantine when one or more residents in your facility test positive for COVID. I know this slide is a little busy, so we'll focus on the ideal practice column. As far as rooming, you should keep patients with COVID-19 isolated to a single room in a single demarked area of the facility. If for some reason your facility does not accommodate single rooms, the best practice is to keep non-positive COVID patients separate from patients with COVID and not allow residents of differing, differing disease status to share a bathroom. If a resident's roommate tests positive for COVID but the roommate has no known diagnosis, diagnosis, you should assume the roommate has been exposed to COVID and isolate them in a separate room. In regards to the assignment of staff caring for COVID patients, if possible, you should create a separate staff team dedicated only to COVID care. If this is not possible, you should assign staff in a way that minimizes the number of staff caring for residents with COVID. As Brooke discussed earlier, PPE should be changed between resident interactions. If PPE is limited, you should always change PPE between interactions of positive resident and non-COVID resident cohorts. Ensuring compassionate care during a pandemic when human and financial resources are significantly strained and when we are balancing professional and personal struggles can be a challenge. Consider using a person-centered approach to help residents make life lifestyle changes that help prevent the spread of COVID. The core concepts of person-centered care are dignity and respect, information sharing, participation, and collaboration. Next, we'll go through some strategies that, that can help you to deliver compassionate care to both your residents and staff. You know your residents best. As much as possible, make them part of the learning process and keep the lines of communication open. If possible, explain to residents the benefits isolation can have on other residents and the larger community so they can better understand why certain protocols are in place. It may also be helpful to consider asking for outside coaching on communication strategies. Lastly, remind residents of their rights and frame COVID-19 care within those rights. For information on residents' rights, protections, and responsibilities, you can visit the above link at health.ny.gov. So some additional strategies for delivering compassionate care include acknowledging that residents may have trouble staying in their room due to worry about the virus and people who are important to them who may be sick. In this context, it's helpful to normalize and validate the resident's feelings. Reiterate that these changes would be difficult for anyone and remind residents of times when they successfully dealt with changes in routine, schedule, or staff. You can also encourage, engage residents in a dialogue focused on problem solving, which we'll go over um, in greater detail in the next slide. Lastly, consider behavioral incentives to help shape and reward resident behavior. Ideally, rewards should be something of the value to the resident. The best way of doing this is mutually deciding what would be rewarding. This may include small food reward, rewards like a can of soda or mini candies or a small bag of chips. It can also include TV time or choice of music. When speaking with residents, it's helpful to create a dialogue focused on problem solving. This involves a two-step process. First, clarify reasons for non-adherence. If residents are having difficulty complying or dealing with the current, current situation, staff should consider why that might be. For example, is there a need for social interaction or are they having difficulties managing frustration or anxiety? And secondly, ask questions and offer prompts to establish a problem-solving framework for the conversation. Define the problem, discuss a range of solutions, and choose a solution. Some phrases to consider using within this framing are listed above. Keeping residents active while physically distanced can be a challenge. 
Acknowledging that residents may miss activities, miss certain activities, will show residents that staff are aware of how this experience is impacting them. As mentioned, try involving them in decision making. Ask your residents what they would like to do. If it's something usually done in groups, think of ways to modify the activity so it'll work within COVID prevention guidelines. Some ideas include exchanging notes at the front desk, commemorating birthdays, providing coloring books, crossword puzzles, mindfulness activities, engaging in activities in the hallway, such as holy bingo, and making sure residents are staying in touch with family and friends by helping set up video chat, phone call, or writing call, um, cards. In addition to residents, it's also extremely important to take steps to ensure the health and well-being of your staff as they navigate this challenging time. Some strategies to prevent burnout and ensure staff feel supported at work include encouraging staff to take short breaks, finding ways to rotate responsibilities, offering or asking to practice infection control techniques with staff, and speaking up if you see staff in an unsafe situation. As the leaders of your facilities, it's also important to take time for self-care for yourself. Even if it's just a moment to take a deep breath, tell a joke, or share a fun movie. As the saying goes, if you want to have enough to give to others, you will need to take care of yourself first. A tree that refuses water and sunlight for itself can't bear fruit for others. All right, next we'll switch gears and talk about New York City's test trace and take care initiative. On June 1st, New York City officially started a new phase in the response to the COVID-19 public health emergency, the beginning of the test and trace core. A coordinated effort to contain transmission of COVID-19 in New York City. Components include expanded testing across New York City, contact tracing, and additional services to support isolation and quarantine recommendations. In residential congregate settings, we at the New York City Department of Health employ team-based approach to case investigation and out outbreak prevention. When cases are detected in a residential congregate facility, the New York City De Department of Health will notify facility management assess details regarding COVID-19 transmission, support the facility by providing technical assistance and identifying resources to support isolation and quarantine strategies, help identify contacts and facilitate contact monitoring, and lastly, facilitate testing, which may include the implement implementation of on-site testing or lab coordination as needed by the facility. All right, and that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, all right, thank you very much, Joanne. Uh, so this is Dan uh, Eris again. Um, just wanna make sure people can hear me. Uh, I know that people were having trouble before. Um, yep, nice and clear, Dan. Okay, yeah, I changed uh, the phone, so maybe this, uh, may, hopefully this will help. Uh, okay, so um, uh, during the presentation, there were a couple, um, uh, a couple of people who put in um, questions on the, on the Q&A section on the, on the right side. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a couple of those questions. Um, and then if you have other questions, you know, feel free to, to ask those. Um, and then I will bring on some uh, some other, uh, you know, Brooke and Joanne and uh, Heidi as well, if, if you would like to um, respond. So let's just go through a couple of these. So the um, first question here uh, uh, says, uh, we have staff members uh, who do not wear masks outside. Um, um, what is the recommendation in this case? Can we really force someone to... To, to do it to wear a mask outside of work. Uh, all right, so, you know, good question. Uh, in general, uh, New York State, the recommendation is that people wear masks when they are outside, especially when uh, they are unable to sort of uh, be in a social distance, uh, an appropriate socially distanced setting. Um, that being said, you know, as a kind of a facility administrator, 
Um, you know, you're not going to be in a position where you can mandate employees uh, wear a mask when they're outside of work. Uh, certainly when they are on your premises, uh, you know, during work hours, then that's possible, but um, uh, you won't be able to do that out, you know, otherwise. Um, okay. Uh, but that being said, uh, your your staff will be um, tested uh, on a weekly basis. That that's per the the New York State mandates. Uh, you know, which, which that is something that you can. You know, you, you will uh, have staff members uh, have. They will be mandated to do that. Um, what is the newest update on air conditioning in the communities? Do they feel it is in the system? Um, so, right, so this is a question about ventilation uh, with regards to COVID. It's a very good question. Um, one that there is sort of active research going on. And uh, what I would say um, is that there really isn't um, kind of a, a final answer. Um, there is some evidence, or, or at least there, there are some studies that indicates that air conditioning um, might propel uh, droplets, at least that's one theory, um, in, in which case it might help in spreading COVID, uh, coronavirus. Um, but on the flip side, um, uh, air conditioners uh, can, can circulate, the, circulate the air and, and cause air exchanges. Uh, and, and actually potentially decrease um, transmission of COVID. So it, it really, it depends on a, on, a, on a variety of different factors. It might depend on the type of air conditioner that, that's being used um, and the filters that are present there. And so uh, long story short is there's really not a, a kind of a, a definitive recommendation about air conditioning. Um, the, the only thing that I can say is that the recommendation is that they should be they can continue to be used uh throughout the summer um when you know with with residents um in the facility uh, and you just need to make sure that they are you know being used appropriately according to the manufacturer's guidance and that they're up to date in terms of uh, monitoring uh and, and that sort of thing but that is the main um the main guidance around around air conditioning and and hopefully we'll have some more kind of science, scientific information um, about that soon. Uh, feel free, Brooke, Heidi, anyone else to say if you want to jump in with, with any, any thoughts on, on these questions. Um, all right, another question here was about um, hand sanitizer. Is it appropriate to use hand sanitizer on gloves um, uh, in between residents? So, uh, so there's a couple of, I think, a couple of questions here. One is, can you put hand sanitizer on your gloves once you put them on? And the answer is yes, uh, you can. Um, you know, your, your glove, depending on what you're touching in the room, can get dirty, can get soiled, and so you're more than welcome to use hand sanitizer on the glove itself, you know, especially if then you are going to touch the, the, the resident. Um, and, you know, the, the appropriate practice um, in terms of the, you know, docking procedure is to hand sanitize the gloves, actually remove the glove and then hand sanitize again. You, sh you shouldn't be wearing the same gloves in between residents. Uh, you know, glove, gloves are, of the different items of PPE, gloves um, really should not be conserved in that way, right? Whereas... Uh, gowns, you know, potentially, or respirator masks, they can, they can be used on, you know, when someone is going from, from room to room, considering that they're uh, all the same type of resident, so either COVID positive or, or not. Um, but gloves really should be changed uh, in between every encounter. But yes, you can use hand sanitizer. Um, uh, fourth question here, what does an ACF need to do uh, do fit testing and properly use respirator masks? Um, what systems oversight do they need to put in place uh, if using those masks? Uh, so this is, this is a good question. Um, and, you know, it, it depends on a variety of things. It, to some extent, it, well, so the, the, the majority of um, 
encounters with the residents um, really don't need a, the, the level of uh, mass protection that, that an N95 respirator needs. Um, you know, those are really meant to be used um, in acute care settings um, during what we call aerosolizing, uh, aerosol producing procedures, um, you know, so during a procedure in the hospital. But the, the majority of encounters that, that one of your staff will have in, in an adult care facility should not require um, uh, an N95 respirator. And so a, a regular, what we call a surgical mask or, or some other face covering should be appropriate. That being said, if, if you still are interested in looking into uh, fit testing, um, there, there's a few things. I, I, maybe Heidi actually can tell more um, about this, but um, for facilities, Article 28 facilities that are regulated by, by New York State, that they, have a, they have a process for um, at least monitoring that, that fit testing is done if it's needed in that facility. Uh, and what you need is um, an occupational health um, uh, person from maybe human resources who's trained in, in doing this. Uh, if your organization doesn't have that, there are outside vendors who can, who can come in and do a, a yearly fit testing, you know, kind of a, you know, at a one time uh, if, if necessary. Um, but again, that's, that's probably above and beyond what's, what's needed. Um, okay, let's see. Um, uh, can we get a copy of the slides? Yes, we're going to provide those. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if they're going to be emailed, Brooke, or if they're going to be uh, just on, on a website that they can be downloaded. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, the the goal is to have them. This is Brooke. Uh, the goal is to have them posted to the uh, uh, New York City Department of Health webpage, um, and so when we can email that uh, link out um, to where exactly it will be on the website. Um, uh, pretty shortly after uh, this um, recording is com is completed, um, time I guess day to be determined, but um, it will be shortly after this. Okay, great. Um, let me see. Uh, what is this is from Sh uh, Cheryl? What is the proper way to dispose of contaminated PPE? Should the PPE be put in the garbage? Does it have to be labeled? Um, all good questions, uh, and truthfully, that, so the, the answer for, for COVID is that um, uh, PPE can be put in the, in the regular trash, essentially. Um, it is, uh, it's not, uh, I don't know if, if people are, were, um, had, had uh, experience with, let's say, Ebola um, or, re or questions around Ebola and, and handling uh, contaminated PPE. Um, that was uh, a very different scenario. That was um, what they call a tier one agent, and that uh, PPE or, or equipment had to be um, handled in a very different way, and that's not the case um, for, for COVID. So it can be uh, put in, in, the, um, in the regular trash. Um, I have a question here from Stephanie uh, Miliano. How soon are facilities going to open? Um, I'm not sure what that question is referring to, uh, if, if you mean, well, which type of facilities, I guess. Oh, oh are they going to open to visitors? Is that, is that your question? I'll, I'll answer that question, and then if, if that's not the case, then um, you know, please uh, clarify it in, in the questions here. Um, so facilities are essentially, they are already open to visitors. Um, Brooke mentioned a little bit uh, about that in, in, in the slide set. Um, there are, uh, there's kind of recommendations from uh, New York State in terms of um, what has to happen for, for visitors to be, uh, to be uh, uh, able to come back into the facility. Um, I believe in, in the slide set, there's a link to that, to that website. But uh, there's a few things, for instance, um, a facility will need to do a, a point prevalence study uh, to, to monitor, uh, to see if there's any um, asymptomatic positive residents, uh, and then um, a subsequent one to, to kind of make sure that there's, there's no one who's uh, persist or uh, no new transmission, let's say. 
Um, but so we, we can help you, um, you know, get that full list of, of recommendations. And then once you kind of meet those, um, uh, those stipulations, then, you know, you can essentially open up again to, for visitation. Um, all right, from Jody White here, what is, uh, uh, what if a resident refuses to quarantine if they have signs and symptoms and is waiting to be tested or waiting for results? Uh, another, another good question. Um, uh, this is very, very tough, uh, and this is actually something that um, uh, us, or, you know, we here at the, at the health department can potentially help you with. Um, so, you know, so, something that you can reach out to us, and, and we can potentially um, offer some some guidance around this. Uh, you know, essentially, you know, we, we need to find the best solution to um, uh, to, to quarantine this resident. Um, and as um, uh, Joanne mentioned, there's a couple of kind of uh, incentives that we can offer, you know, that we might be able to help you offer, um, you know, things like TV time, uh, you know, some snacks, et cetera, some other things that that, that resident might want. Um, and then just having a conversation either with us or with some of our, our kind of behavioral mental health um, colleagues, um, we might be able to, to help facilitate that. So, um, yeah, so that those are those are the kind of recommendations that we have. You know, knowing that this can be a very challenging thing, it's obviously a very uh, isolating thing um, uh, to uh, to have someone you know remain in a room, uh, you know, and not really be allowed to to exit. Or if they if if they do leave their room, they can only do it at certain times of the day. So uh, we we acknowledge that that's a very challenging uh, thing, and and we can work with you to. Uh, to find the best solution for that. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Oh, I have a couple more up here, I think. Uh, there's also, uh, Dan, uh, there's a few yeah. questions in the chat box um, as well. Yeah, I, I think I see those now here. Um, and so that one, uh, when will visitors be able to come indoors? The current guidance is for outside. They, so um, I think we, we mentioned this as well, Brooke, maybe you can, uh, I think you mentioned this, but so the, the, uh, it is possible for visitors to come uh, indoors. And there's, again, there's some stipulations there, making sure that there is kind of a, a socially distanced uh, spaces um, for, for visitation. Um, do you have any other comments on that, Brooke? Um, not really. Mostly that the you know the guidance right now is to have the space outdoors. Um, that guidance may be subject to change, especially as visitation does start to become more common. More facilities can start opening up. Um, so for now, it's exactly what Dan said: is you know if if it can be maintained, if inside in a very wide open and socially distant space, um, then that would be in, in compliance with the guidance that New York State has put out. Um, but to just keep, keep an eye out for any additional guidance that does come out, um, especially as, you know, right now the weather is great and it's nice. Well, some may debate uh, on whether or not it's great, but it's at least sunny. Um, and uh, but as the weather starts to change um, and as we go into the fall and winter season, um, there will probably be some changes to that, uh, those ideas. All right, thanks for that. Okay, and then uh, a couple of questions here about, um, so when can we have social dining for our residents? Um, uh, when can a hairdresser come back in? When can small group programs begin? Um, so uh, the answer to that is is now essentially for all of those. Um, uh, knowing that kind of social, you know, appropriate social distancing is still going to be required. So, um, you know, while residents can still eat in, you know, in a communal dining area, you know, the recommendation is that they sit six feet apart, um, you know, and uh, and and things like that. And so. So some facilities are um, staggering their their meal times for let's say a certain floor can all eat at the same time and then you know different kind of um, uh, kind of options like that or maybe 
um, opening up multiple spaces or an outdoor space for, for residents to also um, have dining. Um, so, so those are some of the kind of thoughts or recommendations now, but that uh, it, it is possible to do that. And then, you know, potentially for some of the, uh, let's say, higher risk or more, more vulnerable residents, they might, um, it might be beneficial to continue kind of in-room meal, um, meal delivery for them. Uh, same thing for small groups, those can occur now. Um, you know, again, you know, um, as long as there are kind of appropriate social distance um, uh, opportunities. So maybe things like yoga outside or, or Zumba outside or, you know, um, uh, other kinds of activities where, you know, you're able to kind of set up stations that, and, they're, and they're physically separate from each other. Uh, my understanding about hairdressers is that they can also come in um, and in the same way that they, you know, essentially need to have appointments and uh, there would be one hairdresser that can, that will uh, come in and then there, there needs to be a, a certain distance between them and, and, uh, and others. And uh, both the resident and the hairdresser needs to, needs to wear a mask during the, the hair cutting. Uh, and if that's not possible, then they, they should not be able to have the haircut. Um, do we have an end date for staff testing and why are hospitals not required to test their staff? Um, so, uh, so this, I guess, is referring to the, to the New York State mandate um, uh, for, for, for weekly testing. It used to be bi-weekly, so twice a week, but now, now it's just once a week. There's no, uh, at least as far as I've seen, there's really no kind of end date um, at this point in terms of when they might um, uh, stop this man stop the requirements um, and truthfully i'm not sure why hospitals um, aren't required to test all of their staff at the same at the same frequency um, but they follow a, a different set of kind of regulatory guidance um, and uh, you know on top of that they have other you know infection control training requirements um, you know, so it's sort of a, a little bit of apples and oranges, but, um, you know, suffice to say, you know, for now and the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the expectation is that um, staff at, at a adult care facilities will, will continue to require um, testing. Okay. Um, Oh, I see. Um, okay, um, Heidi did did uh, put in a comment here uh, about hairdressers that are not not allowed in. Okay, so, sorry for uh, for misspeaking. I, I I do know that in some facilities, like correctional facilities, they are, but maybe in adult care facilities, they're not. So thank you for for correcting that. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Daniel Santana, what about social programs? When are they opening? Um, not sure entirely what you mean about the social programs. If you mean uh, uh, social um, uh, uh, activities for for um, for residents, and once again, they are um, allowed to do that now. Um, but again, as long as there are, um, uh, as long as they kind of conform to social distancing. Uh, all right. I don't see any other questions. So, if we, um, you know, if anyone wants to type in any last minute questions, um, but we will also, um, We'll be sharing, you know, any anything that we, uh, if we if we can go over any kind of questions that we weren't able to answer, we'll um, be sharing that. I, I believe with the with the slide deck and um, with this recording as well. But otherwise, yeah. So I just um, wanted to thank you all for for attending um, our webinar. Um, hopefully this. Uh, sparked some uh, kind of interesting thoughts and questions and things that you can bring back to your facility um, uh, for you to be able to, to use. P please feel free to reach out to, to us and to New York State 
uh, Department of Health as well. Um, if you have any other specific questions, and, and hopefully, you know, there will be follow-up presentations like this that we'll be able to um, provide um, going forward as, as either regulations change or as uh, some of our understanding of, of COVID-19 changes. So, uh, once again, uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, have a good, good rest of your day.